in order to get our love, in order to be appreciated, in order to be noticed, you have to be a certain way. And, you know, it took me a lot of work on myself to realize that that was BS and not what I had to be. I, it, it's more heartwarming to be who I am and to realize everybody's not going to love me and I'm not going to love everybody. Hey, midlifers, welcome to the Midlife Makeover Show. Are you ready to break free from your mundane midlife? Are you feeling trapped in a vicious cycle of rinse and repeat days? No matter if you're experiencing a divorce hangover, job burnout, or you just have the midlife blues, I got you. Hey, I'm Wendy, your hostess of the Midlife Mostess. I too was hit by midlife like a freight train. I too felt stuck in the same dull chapter. I wanted the clarity of how to create a new life beyond divorce and the courage to leave an unfulfilling career. But I kept telling myself that I wasn't worthy and it was just easier to stay in my comfort zone until I found a little secret, the freedom to live my life my way. In this podcast, you will learn how to achieve a vibrant midlife mind and body, how to create solid relationships through love and loss, and how to create an awesome second half of life. Grab your grande latte, pop in your earbuds, and let's get this midlife party started. Welcome back to the Midlife Makeover Show. I'm Wendy Valentine, and today's episode is all about helping you get in touch with your authentic self. Not the self with the lowercase s that was created by society, your friends, your coworkers, your parents, social media, or even you, but your true self with a capital S that resides deep beneath the surface of all that BS. (laughs) The bullshit we subject ourselves to believing is our true self, but it's not. Like Michelangelo, chiseling away at the block of marble to reveal the statue of David, we are going to help you chisel away at the block of marble to reveal the true you. Today's fabulous guest expert who helped, wait, who, let's try that again, (laughs) that will help you do just that, is Eileen Martyr Merman, a New York State licensed mental health counselor and spiritual healing teacher with over 45 years of experience. She integrates psychotherapy, spirituality, meditation, and alternative healing in her private practice. She has been a senior teacher at a Society of Souls, that sounds so cool, for the past 20 years, led healing retreats across Europe and the U.S., and practiced meditation for 50 years. Wowza! And I think I'm cool at five years. (laughs) (laughs) That's impressive. Graduating from Syracuse University in 1977, you look really good for your age, by the way, Eileen continually explores diverse modalities like non-dual Kabbalistic healing, gestalt therapy, psyche, and more. Emphasizing the possibility of personal transformation at any age, she is committed to help others feel guided and on the path to healing and authenticity. Eileen resides in New York balancing her professional life with family, knitting, that is so impressive, art, theater, (laughs) and the joy of connecting with her grandson weekly. Eileen's lifelong passion is guiding others towards freedom, healing, and authenticity. Eileen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. (laughs) Uh, Do you like my little Michelangelo? uh... (laughs) Love it. Love it. And so... As you talked about Michelangelo, I was remembering when I was in the Sistine Chapel and just imagining how he was, you know, upside down painting. Yes. That he did that, you know. It's fascinating. And I'm sure you might know this, but like when they asked him, how did you carve the statue of David? He's like, oh, that was easy. I just carved away everything that was not him. Right. Exactly. That's what we're doing. Yeah. To reveal the angel in the marble. And I... I was thinking a lot about that this morning um, when I was like reading your bio and thinking about like the BS, like the bullshit that we do believe and we continue to believe because we want to be like good little girls and people pleasers and make sure we don't piss anyone off and we got to do all the right things. And, And I was thinking more about that, but it's silly. First question for you is what is the BS? Where does that come from? 
And why do we cling to it? So we we cling to it because it becomes our identity. Yeah. So when we're very young, we are taught not just verbally, but it's also in the energy, in the ethos of the family, of the of the culture, of the the lifestyle. You know, so there are beliefs about how we should be and not how to be the self, right? Yep. So you had to be proper. You had to be, you know, fit into a little box in a particular way. And um, yeah, so yep. we develop all these shoulds. And, you know, it could be from generations ago, mm-hmm. you know, in order to get our love, in order to be appreciated, in order to be noticed, you have to be a certain way. Yeah. And, you know, it took me a lot of work on myself to realize that that was BS and not what I had to be. I, it, it's more heartwarming to be who I am and to realize everybody's not going to love me and I'm not going to love everybody. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I always say like you, you can't be all things to all people, but you can be all things to you. Right. right. Yeah. What, what were some of your, your biggest limiting beliefs that were just like, uh, weighing you down in life that you really had to like take a chisel to it and get rid of it. So you could be the true you. Yeah. To be powerful. Mm -hmm. Right. So I believe that, um, if you're too powerful, if you're too outspoken, um, you know, certainly as a woman, you know, I'd be called a bitch, uh, and mm-hmm. all kinds of nasty names. And the, the thought of that was terrifying. I, I just, it, and it was like, they don't see who I am and so on. So to really, um, I mean, basically like to really shine your light that was inviting in conflict. Uh, completely. Yeah. And judgment. Uh-huh. Right. You know, and there's a, a lot of judgment, like, um, especially when I was growing up, like in the, in the sixties, the sixties were wild and that helped mm. shake things up and help me know that I could be more of who I am, except in the sixties, I was still in my teenage years in the seventies. I knew that I had to be who I was. And I did all kinds of things to seek out who I was mm. without having to have that voice say, no, be quiet, just listen, don't give your opinion, don't talk about this, don't talk about that, don't wear those things. Mm-hmm. Now, I just wear, now I just wear jeans and I wear black and jeans, you know? That's yeah, funny. I know, that's me. Well, especially for me in an RV, I'm like, I'm elastic pants and a tank top. I mean, like, you're lucky today I'm wearing this fancy red shirt, but... <laughs> very, pretty, very pretty. Yeah. I'm, but you, I'm wearing you're so bit. right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, that's so nice. Oh yeah. I see a little bit of red in there. A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. That's so cute. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it, isn't, it, isn't it interesting though? These beliefs that we adopt and we don't even really know it. We don't know that we're adopting this belief and that it could be somebody else's belief, but we do it because we think that's what we're supposed to do. And I'm sure I know you know this, but it's like, as children, like we have these little, you know, sponges in our head, these are our brains that are just absorbing everything around us. And we're taking note of like, oh, he treated her that way or she did that. So that must be right. That must be right. That must be truth. And then we we adopt those beliefs. And then next thing you know, you're in your 20s and 30s and 40s and you're still believing something that happened when you were seven or 13. And it was, it's not like until I feel like until you consciously stop and observe and, and question it, like, do I really think that, you know, do I really think that if I'm shine my light into the world that I will be judged maybe, or that I won't be liked maybe, but do I really believe that? Right. So the truth of the matter is we will be judged and the, but you know, then we lose ourselves to try to shape ourselves to be a certain way, as opposed to being who we are and saying, it's really okay. It's part of life. It's part of the human condition. You know, like you said, not everybody is for everybody. Not every technique is for everybody. We have to find our place in this life. And it's very freeing. And then, 
you know, we have to long for freedom. We have to really yearn to be uh, walking in life as best as we can, because there's a lot of tough stuff that happens yep. and that we can't control at all, even though we think we can. Yeah. And, you know, the the number one regret of the dying is living life for everybody else, not living life for yourself and being basically true to yourself. It's really true. Yeah. I mean, and that, and that interesting though, that like, that's, you know, obviously haven't had that experience of near death. Well, kind of a few times, but, (laughs) but to actually be on your deathbed and someone asking what's your number one regret, I wish I would have just lived life for me. Right. Exactly. And how, how horrible to like, and I think about them, like, I don't, as part of the reasons why I started this show, because I don't. I don't want people to get to the end of their life and going, damn it, what a shoulda, coulda, you know, because then that's it. Like there is no, you're at the end. And there's that famous, there's that famous quote, if not now, when? Yes. Because the truth is we might think we have, we might think we want to live a long life, but we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen in the Uh -uh. world, in the world, which is a crazy place and in our health and just crossing the street and so on. We just don't know. So yeah. if not now, when, you know? Yeah. Just- I mean, I, I think a lot of us take life for granted, myself included, where you just think, oh, I got all the time in the world. La, 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 la. Then that five years goes by. Ten, I mean, a hundred years. If you are lucky enough to live to a hundred, that's just like a blink of time and eternity. That's like, boop, done. That's right. A hundred years. It's like, it already feel like I'm stressing at 51. Like, shit, I got so much to do. I, like, I got to write a book. I got to, like, I got to go to Italy. Like there's so much to do, you know? There and is I so think, much to do. So much. Yeah. So where, do you, how, because especially like if you've got a ton of limiting beliefs, a, a huge chunk of marble, if you will, that you have to chisel away at, where do you begin? How do you, how do you start? We have to start by questioning everything, Mm. turning things on their head, but we don't have to do every single thing all at once. You take one thing that you're aware of today, you know, I'm aware of, um, let's say that I didn't speak up in a class when I should have, or I didn't speak up with the person that I met with yesterday and I should have. And then you start to really become conscious of how you stop yourself. You want to become conscious of those thoughts, you know, where you say, shh, be quiet. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, don't, don't, don't create a mess or um, be nice. You know, that's, that's a biggie, you know, like don't be who you are. And so you want to start waking up to those feelings and those thoughts, and then you could start to change them. Now, a lot of us are terrified, if not all of us are terrified of change. But you know what? Every day there's change. Yep. We just try to avoid it because we don't want to feel anxious. But feeling anxious about change is part of being a human being. Yeah. So we have to learn how to put everything in its place and know that, oh, okay, so I'm anxious about that. Okay. I wish Mm -hmm. I wasn't, but I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, next thing, you know, so just keep waking up and and realizing how we consciously we want to make conscious what's unconscious. So unconsciously we're stopping ourselves. So if we start really observing ourselves, sort of like watching a little movie, Mm -hmm. watching yourself and waking up, and it's a slow process. And you know, there are processes that help. There are all different kinds of modalities that help. Um, it's really great to do therapy if you haven't done any therapy, but you want to find somebody that doesn't push you. You want to find somebody that helps you remember your story and not have to make up additional stories uh, mm-hmm. about, you know, what went on, what might have gone on. And if you don't have any memories, that's okay. Just say, I, I don't remember what went on. And yeah. then you want to try different modalities. You want to, you know, write gratitude 
journals, or if you think that's like too woo woo, you know, you want to just be conscious at the beginning of the day, what is it that I want to accomplish today? At the end of the day, what is it that I regret, you know, and Mm -hmm. what would I do differently? I I do, I do a little prayer every day, usually in the morning and, and a lot at night. Yeah. So, but it's not a religious prayer. It's an Eileen prayer. So you do your own thing, you know, I was listening to, uh, you know, a bunch of your podcasts just to get a sense of who you are um, mm-hmm. before we met today. And the uh, the um, show that I listened to the most was the, I can't f- remember his name. He was I know, lo- I can't either. I'm drawing a blank. The ketamine, ketamine, the ketamine guy, you know, so he was talking about psychedelics. And yeah. what I found when I was young, because I did psychedelics when I was, you know, 20, um, <laughs> a lot of those, um, is it woke me up to the oneness of reality. And then after, I mean, I did drugs for a bunch of years, even though I was going to college and I, I did well enough in college and I got my degree and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But what it made me realize was that it made me realize the BS. Like I could have written the book back then that I wrote now, but not with all the wisdom that I have all these Mm. years later. But a lot of the stories in the book are from back in those days. And um, but that's only one route. Not everybody wants to do drugs. Um, So there are all these different modalities that could help support us to be who we are. But again, if you're working with somebody that's pushing you to be a certain way, I say go away. Yeah, exactly. And I tell people before, you know, either, even in my personal life, they're like, oh, I've tried therapy. I didn't like it. Well, you just didn't find the one. Like, that doesn't mean therapy is bad. Therapy is amazing. And I wouldn't have gotten to be where I'm at without therapy. You wouldn't have gotten to be where you're at. Right. And I and I also recommend just trying to, like you were saying, tons of different things. Like, I've you know, between um, I've done group therapy, one-on-one therapy, EMDR, um, Psych K. Um, I've read a kajillion books. Just go to the self help right. section. I've read them all. Yep. <laughs> but the thing is, like, and why did I do all that? I did it because I wanted to get to my true Wendy. Like, I was so exhausted with trying to be something or someone that I was not. Like, the, it's actually more trouble to to be, to stay in that, to be a, someone that you're not, then to actually go through, do all the work to get to your true self, like be the Michelangelo, grab the chisel and just like start cutting away. <laughs> it might take you weeks, months, years. And actually, I think even still, it's a, it's a process that continues for life. Yeah. Right. I mean, I feel like when you get the larger chunks cut away there, when those fall off, then you don't have as much. You're not weighed down as much, but you might all of a sudden like realize you adopt something within the last year or two where it was like, wait a second, hold up, Wendy. No, we don't believe that. Like that is ridiculous. And then you have to, okay, let's chisel away at that because right. yeah, I mean, the key is, I guess, to just continue, continue. I can't talk today. Yeah. Look, the truth of the matter is life life goes on until yeah. it doesn't. And then who knows, yep. maybe it even goes on afterwards, you know? Yep. And so it's all about awakening to who we are. And I mean, that's what people like about all the psychedelics is it gives you this experience of oneness that everything is interconnected. Everyone and everything is. Mm-hmm. So if that's true, then yep. that could that could just change our lives and help us to deal with the difficulties that exist. I mean, for many, yeah. many years, I was trying all different kinds of shamanism things. I yeah. mean, now shamanism things are great, yeah. but what I was trying to do is find something, whether it was shamanism or Buddhism or, mm. uh, I don't know, I did all kinds of things, yeah. uh, 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 vision quests and so on to escape my true yes. self. Yes. I thought that I could be more uh, enlightened without being empowered. Yes, I know what you mean. I needed to have my power and be all of who I am. Now, empowerment, I don't mean that you're going to be nastier. I I don't mean that you're going to be acting out. In fact, if you're acting out and being nastier, you know, like stop, wake up, what's going on? Because that's not empowerment. 
It's about really expressing yourself in a kind way. Mm -hmm. And the best way to become kind is to allow yourself to find out what the dark night of the soul is, what the difficulties have been and are for you. And, and know that, you know, even though everybody has a different story, we all have a story yeah. and, and life is not so easy. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what made us think that life should be easy I know. <laughs> yeah. all the time, but I guess that's a fantasy of like Mickey and Minnie at the end of the yeah, la, la, la. <laughs> driving out into the sunset like that, you know? Um, yeah. One of the things I learned when I um, did positive psychology was, we're human beings being human. Like we have to remind ourselves we're, you're a human being. Like don't, you're not like, Oh, everything. Like you were saying, it's like, life is not supposed to be just smooth sailing. Right. But that's, but it's the rough patches that where you learn and where you grow. It's like so, a comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows there. So it's like, I, I actually invite, not that I really want to be uncomfortable all the time, But if something uncomfortable is happening in my life or within me, then I'm like, okay, what is this? Because this is an opportunity for growth here. I don't shy away from it anymore. And, you know, one thing I want to say, there's a quote from Marianne Williamson. um, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness that most frightens us. So for me, I was really scared of my light. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, what if I really do shine? If I, if I allow myself to shine, oh, geez, then I really have to step out there. Yep. Because I knew what my gifts and talents were, but I was trying to hide them and even blame others for, oh, you won't let me shine my light because of this. And really it was me making an excuse, right? And that may have been true when you were young, but now it's it's an excuse, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it goes back to the same story. Not everybody's going to love you. Not everybody's going to, you know, people are going to judge you. But so we have to deal with that, you know. So, okay. And, oh, I have so many things to do. Yes, we do, you know, mm-hmm. as working. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Not- Busy and busyness could be like an addiction, basically, and an it excuse. Is. It is. And it's a way to be, you know, like a lot of people say to me, okay, so now I realize that. Now what do I do? It's like, oh, like slow down. Yeah slow down. If you allow yourself to realize what it is that's giving you the trouble that you're having this trouble, Mm. that might shift things organically from the inside out, as opposed to having to do. So if you have to do anything, be more conscious, spend Mm. more time being more conscious instead of, I have to, I have to, I have to do this. I have to do that. And again, you know, having support along the path, really important whether it's reading books and listening to podcasts, Pod, the podcasts are great. I know. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> there are just so many great ones out there and just listening to other people's experiences and seeing mm-hmm. that you're not alone because we all struggle with different situations, but at, at the bottom of it, at the root of it is our dissatisfaction with being imperfect human beings and yeah. learning how to say, Oh, that's just, part of life. And yep. I can change that. But once we do all that work, we're more compassionate human beings. We're more compassionate toward ourselves and to others. Yeah. It's funny. Uh, the old Wendy would have been stressing so badly. Like in the beginning when I was doing your intro and I tripped over my tongue, <laughs> I would have been stressing so badly about that. And now I'm like, I don't care. Right. And I completely it, it, forgot about it until you just reminded me. Yeah. Isn't that funny though? But I, I don't care about that stuff anymore because it's, it's so, and if somebody else out there really cares, I'm like, I don't care about that. <laughs> I don't think right. Right, but right. I feel like when, when you really get to the core of your true self, you find that you're not trying to explain who you are. You're not trying to make excuses. You're just, it, it relieves so much pressure because you can just be yes. just, just be. Yeah. Yeah. It's more an organic walking one step and then the next step and then the next step. And then sometimes you have to stop and Mm -hmm. pause and take a look at what's going on with situation or how you might be reacting to something or, you know, why you did what you did. But then, then after you do that consciousness raising work, then you could continue 
moving on, moving on, yeah. moving on. I was, you know, when I'm uh, going back to the ketamine, I think the biggest thing that I got out of that was realizing that I was the one that was standing in my own way and that I had to you know, like basically go, I was telling myself, like, as if my soul was talking to me going, girl, get out of my way. I got stuff to do. <laughs> like, okay, so sorry. Like, take all those limiting beliefs and shove them <laughs> because I don't have time for that. I need to get out of my way. I got stuff to do. And that just totally lifted so much for me. It was like, I think I was telling you before, that was like the final, that was like the the lock that finally opened it. It was just like, oh, there, I can breathe. Yeah. Yeah. Because you realize the truth. Yeah. That you don't have to keep yourself tight and you don't have to keep saying, you know, be good, stop yes. that, mm-hmm. you know, lower your voice. Um, yeah. Wear, wear different clothes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. Yes. I've heard it all. And even too, I mean, especially with social media now, it's, you know, that can be stressful for a lot of people. It's yep. not to, to me, a lot of people ask me, how do you just put yourself out there? I'm like, I just do it. Cause I'm like, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. Like, again, you can't be all things to all people. I mean, I get criticism all the time on social media does not bother me. Cause I, yep. I mean, I, I have more important things to do for the world than to be concerned about the next hater. Like, yep. Mm, yep. whatever. Yep. 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 I'm I'm actually, if anything, I'm so humbled that they took the time <laughs> to write out a nasty comment. I'm like, I'm so jealous of you because you have that time. I'm like, I can't do it. <laughs> I just I always know. wonder, I, I always wonder, like, what are you doing with your life if you're spending time <laughs> just scrolling through and like being yeah. hateful? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I know. I'm like, I'm so jealous of you that you have that much time, you know? Do you ask yourself questions like, who am I? What is my purpose? Why am I living a life I don't love? Answers to these questions and more are revealed in the new Freedom at Midlife group coaching program, where I offer you a guaranteed roadmap to your own midlife makeover. In this powerful seven-week program, you will learn the seven steps to freedom method to help you discover who you want to become, what life you want to live, and most importantly, how to get there. Instead of being lost in life, miserable in menopause, or struggling to juggle it all, you could reignite your love life, retire that dreadful job, and reinvent yourself. So if you're ready to begin your midlife journey of transformation filled with accountability, guidance, and support, then the time is now. Your midlife needs you to make a move. The Freedom at Midlife program is opening for enrollment soon with limited spots available. To be the first to know when we are open for enrollment, please join the waitlist now at freedomatmidlife.com and you will soon discover that next courageous step in creating your epic second half of life. So tell us more about the book. So the book is really what I realized after I wrote the whole book is it was really a love letter to my younger self. Oh. Right? So I talk about um, literally my birth, you know, where I was born, what that was like. I talk about lineage. I talk about my confusion about who I am. I don't tell people what to do. There's a lot of self-help books that are do this, then this, then the, here, yeah. here's the 10 steps to freedom or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't tell people what to do tell people what I've done, what worked for me. And I'm hoping that that's going to help to free them. I talk about ritual, how that, that helps me. I talk about prayer. I talk about kindness. I talk about hate. Mm. Um, what else I talk? Oh, nourishment. Oh if, yeah. You know, in that chapter, I talked about, um, I had this revelation when I was a young mother mm. quite a while ago already And we were on the airplane and I was going down to Florida to visit my parents with the baby. And it said that I'd have to put the oxygen on myself first. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. Now I've been flying a lot over the years before I became a mother. I mean, I was 29 when I became a mother and I was like, but it was the first first time I really heard what they were saying (laughs) because I I was listening. You were connecting it more. 
you know? So it was like, oh, wow, I have to put it on me because what good is it that baby has it on him if I don't have it on me? Yeah, yeah. So so I have a chapter on nourishment and different things that I did to wake up and and do for myself. And, you know, there's a difference between being selfish and uh, and being self-nourishing and taking time for the self. And a lot of people say, oh, but that costs a lot of money. I said, no, there's a lot of things that we could do that don't cost a lot of money. Yeah. So you don't have to go to a spa you know, you don't. Oh yeah, exactly. It's, it's not about like getting a pedicure. It, it's even saying no to something that you feel obligated to say, yes, you got to go to this party or whatever it is saying no is going, okay, I'm actually taking care of myself. Right. You're, you're respecting yourself enough to, to not get stuck into things that you don't want to do. And what's an interesting thing is if we say no enough, Mm-hmm. Then when something comes up that you really don't want to do, but you love the person and you want to be there for them. Then you go because you've said no enough yes. that, it, that it's in you to push yourself to go do this other thing, whatever the other thing is, whether yes. it's an event or uh, something else. Don't, so, don't we really appreciate like, I mean, I do like really like real people, like just honest, authentic you can tell that they're connected with themselves and they're they're going to tell you how it is. Even if you don't like what they have to say, you somehow deep down kind of appreciate the, yep. the rawness and the authenticity. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And if I don't, I say, you know, I really don't dig what you're saying, but you know. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I, I like those kinds of relationships. Um, and then, you know, a lot of relationships are, you know, I think of it as a, that there's different circles. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're the people closest to you. They're the inner circle. And then there's the next level, you know, and we have different circles of friends and relationships with different people. And, um, you know, it's all about honesty and we have to be on another really important way to become more authentic is to be Mm -hmm. honest with ourselves, because if we are not honest with ourselves, then. Yeah, exactly. Much more confused and unhappy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just so that's the waking up. How am I not honest with myself? Right. You know, I mean, I used to never think I was anxious. Mm. That's how that's how well controlled I was. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, oh, I am anxious. Mm. I don't want to feel it yet. You know, so I had to go through different stages or. um I wonder why I'm not anxious today with something going on like this. Yeah. I sort of should be, you know, this is anxiety provoking, you know? So, so it's, it's really like, like having those deep conversations with yourself. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, like you do have to, you need, uh, one of the things I loved about my first year of, you know, taking off in the RV was just me, myself and I. And that was like, the, a lot of people ask, like, were you lonely? I'm like, no, I'm like, there's a difference between being alone and lonely. Right. And I wanted to give myself that gift <clears throat> of just being able to be with me and, and to have those, those nights of silence and just sitting there and just like, am I scared? Am I, am, am I lonely? Like just questioning things. Right. And right. Yeah. I mean, I right. probably got more in touch with my true self during that time than any other time in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really important to do that, whether you're Mm -hmm. in, you know, going the way I went or going the way Mm -hmm. went, went, you know, it's really important to question ourselves and take some time, even if it's just a few minutes. It It doesn't have to be, you know, a lot of people that meditate, meditate for like 40 minutes, an hour. I like Mm -hmm. to do that once in a while, but I like to do other things also. You know. Yeah. So um, do you jur- do you journal? Um, not too much. I used yeah. to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I used I just, to. I just started back up again. Yeah, I used to journal a lot. Um, I think writing the book, mm-hmm. um, helped get helped me finish off so many things that were still in me. I was actually surprised as I was writing about different things that, um, like my intuition, I have a chapter on intuition and, you know, remembering that I have a chapter on synchronicity and this I love 
Synchronicity was, this is an interesting one. So my mother and Jackie O were born two days, one day apart (laughs) and very different lifestyles. Both loved art. Both Mm -hmm. were married to incredibly handsome, um, engaging men. Mm -hmm. Um, Both were, um, you know, two different, two different worlds, but They both got the same kind of cancer, a different brand mm. of it. And Jackie ended up dying from um, the first, she only got the first cancer. My mother got a second cancer, but similarities. But we were waiting online to go into a Picasso exhibit at the Metropolitan, uh, was it MoMA? Uh, the the Modern Art Museum oh, here mm-hmm. in Manhattan. Yep. And <clears throat> all of a sudden, we're in a room, me and mom, Jackie O, and the Secret Service. Oh my gosh. And we ended up, what? and I was like, I was not going to say anything because I figured they would stop walking with us. And we're walking from room to room. Now, what's what's the odds of that happening with these two women born within probably 24 hours of each other, similar in the art world, similar beauties, similar so much similarity. Wow. I actually wrote about that synchronicity. But as I wrote the book, there were so many things that I was tying up loose ends. There was one uh, experience that I had, and I was a freshman in college, and I don't remember her name right now. The girl across the hall came to say, I want, I might cry, came to say mm-hmm. something to me, and I found her annoying. And I said whatever I said. And Back in the day, so it was the early 70s, we used to have these these boards where we would put up, we need a ride share to go here, to go here. She went, she went to go, I was going to Syracuse University, and she wanted to go visit her boyfriend over in a college in New Jersey, and she never got there. Um, and so when the, then we have had the FBI walking around the dormitory, you know, interviewing all of us, and they didn't find her remains until much, much later, like 20, Mm. 30 years later, through a psychic that the family uh, was uh, going to, told them to look at this area up in Syracuse where they were doing a building and they found her bones. Oh my God. So all these different kinds of memories, wonderful memories, horrible memories. Yeah in between kind of memories came up and I had done tons and tons of therapy and spiritual work and meditation and so on and so on. And the amount of stuff that showed up for me was, uh, sometimes shocking. Mm. It's very enlightening. It's like, wow, you know, even though I've worked so much on myself, there's still so many, so much residue that remains. So I found that a lot of the stuff that I would write in my journal, you know, I thought about this today or this happened or I'd like to do this differently or I'm grateful for this. I I don't have to do anymore because it was really a finishing up. So writing the book in my 30s would have been very di- different than writing the book that I wrote, which was in my late 60s. So yeah. mm-hmm. I totally agree. Um, I'm actually starting to write my book in the next couple of weeks. And, and I was thinking that I'm like, I wouldn't be able to write this book. I wouldn't be able to write it five years ago because it's basically, it's, it's based upon the, the Wendy that I created in the last five years. Right. Yeah. So it's so, so interesting. Do you find that some people fear making the changes in their life because their relationships might change? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. A lot of people um, start doing healing work and they get a stronger sense of themselves and then they have to stop because there's just too much fear that they're going to have to change. And you don't have to change, but Mm -hmm. changes, I mean, every day, you know, there's a different moment. I mean, impermanence, you know, we're all going to die one day. Yeah. God willing, we'll have a long life and a better life and so on, but we don't know, you know, Mm -hmm. so, um, change is scary because we think that we have to change everything and we don't have to change everything we can. Right. Right. Yeah. Just take one step forward. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it could be little. Mm -hmm. Giving yourself permission to dress the way you want to dress. I mean, in this, right. uh, this point in life, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't allowed to wear pants to school, not because of my parents, but because of the rule in the school system back in the day. Yeah. We weren't allowed to wear pants until I think they call it now middle school. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. Sixth, seventh and eighth grade. Mm -hmm. I think around eighth grade, they changed the rules. I mean, so, that, so those kinds of crazy things are ingrained in us. I have to look a certain way. I have to dress a certain way. So do simple things. Like if you're overburdened at work, mm -hmm. you don't have to quit. Right. You could just, you know, get support from people. How should I say this to my mm -hmm. supervisor? Or how could I do this differently? And often, like Wendy, you said a few minutes ago, often the problem is us. Right. Thinking we have to say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. Thinking that, you know, this means that um the best person, this means that I'm irreplaceable. You know, like stop with yeah. that because we are replaceable for the most part. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, and we could be happier if we're not holding on to these preconceived notions about how we should be, how we should act, what we should say, what how others should be. That's a big yeah. thing. We think, oh, they should, they're not like me. Well, they're, they're who they are now. Do you exactly. want to have a relationship with them with their imperfections and your imperfections or not? So yep. those are big things that people really struggle with. Yeah. One, one of the things that uh, this was a long time ago that I realized about myself was trying to control my relationships because I almost, I had a fear of abandonment since I was a kid, since a little mm -hmm. girl. And so I would try to make sure that this relationship was perfect just so I wouldn't get abandoned again. Right. Instead of, and then I finally woke up one day and go, wait a minute, I just need to let these people be who they are. And if they go, they go, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was exhausting to me. It took up so much energy <laughs> to try to control all this stuff. And I was like, Wendy, why don't you just worry about Wendy? You yeah. know? Yeah. So true. Yeah. So yeah. true. Yeah. What is what is the um the serenity prayer? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah. So true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I remind myself of that a lot when I'm like thinking like I've you know I'm losing control of something or or that like oh I should have a better grip on all of this. I'm like wait a minute, what is really in my control here? What can I really do? Right. 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 There's and so there's control and there's control. Like there's certain yeah. things we can, can control, like you know yeah. how we're going to speak to somebody or how we're going to you know eat and you know right. live a lifestyle and so on. And there's stuff in life that we just can't control, and we never know what's going to be next. And um and that's nerve wracking. And if you could yeah. open up to more of your true self. And have different practices, whether it's journaling, meditation, going for walks, you know, doing art. You know, I love the knitting and I uh, I love doing um, all different kinds of art. But but if when I paint, it's for nobody to see, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but That's great, though. But I think, you know, the key is just to experiment and try different things and, you know, whatever. Take a pottery class. See if that if that lights up your soul and stick with that, try, you know, go walking, hiking, like whatever, anything just to engage with yourself and get yes. more connected. Right. And it's helpful to have friends that mm. support you in doing that. Yeah. You don't need a million friends. You just need a small group of people around you that, that support you and that you support them. You know? Right. Yeah. And I was going to say too, that really embrace the struggle because it, like you said earlier, change is challenging. It's difficult. It's going to be hard, but just embrace that and like even be okay with that. Like, yep, I'm having a really bad day. Yep. I feel like just laying in bed and crying. Okay, fine. Like give right. yourself permission to just be whatever the change, however it takes place. Yeah. Just acknowledging, okay, today is this, today's a good day. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. guys, today's not so good, or I feel outraged, or I feel quiet, or just to yeah. be where you're, you're at as best as you can. 
Yeah. I always think about the um, the butterfly when it's trying to break free from the cocoon. And like it has to it has to struggle like it pumps the blood through its through its veins and its wings. And then it's like like pushing to come out of the cocoon. And that if you actually cut the top of a cocoon and you took the butterfly out, the butterfly would die. It would be crippled and it would die. So like if you ever like see a a butterfly that's like (laughs) wobbling along, it's because it didn't actually struggle enough to come out of the cocoon. So I always think about that. I'm like, okay, in order for me to fly, to set myself free, be okay with the struggle. Yeah. 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 Or or when we're not okay to accept that we're just not okay today. Yeah. Yeah. It's just part of life. And, you know, it's really rewriting the definition of life. Life is not supposed to be whatever the fantasy was that we thought it should Mm -hmm. be. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's so unfair. Life should be like this and and so on. It's like, well, I don't know that that's true. Yes. You know, how do we deal with life as it is? And um, that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, vote for change and you know, mm-hmm. want things to be different um, yeah. because there's that too. So, you know, just waking yeah. up. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up it, it, uh, because that was probably one of the most difficult things for me was to accept that I was having an imperfect day or that I just, I would always felt like I had to put on a happy face and Wendy's okay. Of course I'm okay. And like deep down, I'm not okay. You know, but yeah, now right. I'm like, yep, I'm having a shitty day. <laughs> like, exactly. Just being okay with it. Like it's totally okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because, oh. you know, the amount of energy that we have to use. Yes. To fake it is <laughs> exhausting. Not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So where can we find you? So I'm on the uh, internet, on the web at EileenMartimerman.com. So I'm assuming on the show notes, you'll have. Yeah, I'll put that. Yeah, it's well, M-A-R-D-E-R-M-I-R-M-A-N. But I'll put that in the show notes for sure. (laughs) And then my book, my book, How I Think I Should Be is BS. From Hiddenness to Open Hearted. So this you could find in the United States in just about any bookstore. And even if they don't have it in a small indie bookstore, they could order it. And a lot of people in Europe that I know, they got this book the day before it came out. Wow. In the States. Yeah. So you could get it anywhere. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Such a good book. How I think I should be is bullshit. Yeah. 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 Love it, love it, love it. Even forgiveness. You know, you don't have to forgive your your the people that hurt you. You have to forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, everything is different and it makes a difference. Yes, we do need to forgive ourselves for being imperfect human beings and not take it lightly. Mm -hmm. And um it makes a difference, but we don't have to forgive everybody that hurt us. Yeah, I know. I'm so glad you said that. I used to think you had to. Yeah, we all did. And a yeah. lot of a lot of therapists say, "Oh, no, you have to forget, forgive forgive." Yeah. Mhm. And, and a lot of, you know, religion and cultures, you have to do that. Like, but maybe I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. some things it's just not right, you know, for you. Whatever yeah. that. Is. Yeah. So, okay. So I don't forgive everybody. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm imperfect. But even that alone, that realization brings peace. Just knowing that if you're not ready to forgive and like that's in itself is like, okay, that's acknowledging how you feel. Right. But, yeah. but, but what we want to do is use that forgiveness thread, let's say that we all have the, the capacity to do yeah. toward ourselves, bring that yeah. kindness in here, the self-compassion in here and, and that makes all the difference because there is something about forgiveness that's very healing. And yes. when I forgive myself for this or this or this. Mm-hmm. And I would have to say probably we're, we're, I mean, we're hardest on ourselves and it's more challenging to even forgive ourselves for not being who we truly are. Yeah. But to authentically forgive somebody else is a yeah. whole other thing. You know, a lot of people yeah. say, oh, I forgive so-and-so for 
this. And it's like, mm -hmm. really? Do you really? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like a blanket forgiveness. Like, yeah, I forgive everybody. Yeah. Really. I've, I've done that, for that one person. I've done that already. Yep. <laughs> uh, so are you able to see clients outside of New York? So I, I work uh, remotely at this point. Oh, nice. So what happened was I was um, teaching in Europe. And um, so at that point, we were doing it on Skype and then started. Then when Zoom came in, yeah. when Zoom was born, uh, it had better, it has better reception. So yeah. uh, Skype, I'm sure Skype has improved by now. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but a lot of us left them. And before that, I was doing freeconferencecall.com where I could, you know, have groups and classes and stuff on that. But um, I work with everybody. Uh, oh, that's so nice. This way. Yeah. Oh, that's good to know. And then do you, do you still do retreats or workshops? I do everything. Yeah. So right. uh, the last workshop I gave was for women about, um, our intuition. In fact, um, I was just talking to the person that helps me out with social media and so on about how do we how do we get that workshop that I did on so people could buy the workshop. I think I charged thirty six dollars. Yeah. So, so at some point we could do that. I said we'll figure that out next week. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So there's that. There's the book, and I have this course, which is a six week course, and pretty much how to stop the how to start stopping the BS. Mm. So I'm going to be doing that again, either probably right after the summer. So what I did before I did it last year, and it's all based on the book, but I have different, uh, it's like a six week course, right? So mm. it's about finding freedom, waking up, shifting, communicating habits, being open hearted, all different simple ways that mm. help us to be more authentic in a gentle way. Yeah. And um you know, so, I, I have found that the simplest of teachings are the most profound. Sometimes we're expecting some like major, like, you know, but I, I don't know, for me, as I look back, it's like those simple little things that were the eye-opening moments for me, the ahas. Yeah, they help. They really, yeah. really make a difference. Some of us look for the the big high. Yeah, in, yeah. First, which is what the way, that was definitely my path. Yeah. Um, but this is more about how to live a life filled with more freedom every day. Yeah. Um, so, so I'll be doing that. And I also, what I also gave last year, and I'll probably do it a couple of times this year is a free webinar on stopping the bullshit, you know? Oh, nice. So, you know, that was fun. And, um, so. Well, thank you. Well, yeah, definitely go to her website. I love your website too. It's very pretty. Thank you. I'm a nerd with stuff like that. That's what I look for. I'm like, oh, look at that website. I like it. She's yeah. in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. Thank you, Wendy. It was a pleasure to meet you. Yes, you too. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Did this podcast inspire you, challenge you, trigger you to make a change or spit out your coffee laughing? Good. Then there are three ways you can thank me. Number one, you can leave a written review of this podcast on Apple iTunes. Number two, you can take a screenshot of the episode and share it on the social media and tag me, Wendy Valentine. Number three, share it with another midlifer that needs a makeover. You know who I'm talking about. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Get out there and be bold, be free, be you.